The Soviet heavy tank IS-2 has a stronger frontal armor than a Tiger, a bigger gun than a King Tiger and at the same time was just one metric ton heavier than a Panther. So how was this possible? To answer this question, we asked Peter Tank Archive Samsonov, who looked into Soviet sources of the time. He published a book with us, The IS-2, which you can get at the following link or on Amazon. The IS-2 was the result of work that was very, very conscious about weight. Um, the KV-2 started out at 40 tons and then very quickly blew up to first 44 tons and then 47 tons. Then by the end of 1941, all of 50 tons. Uh, and then it was cut back down to 42 tons with the KV-1S and then started growing again with the KV-85. And so there wasn't really any kind of, you know, there's no wizard spell, you no know, wand you can wave to say, okay, I could have a tank that's bigger and better and more modern at less weight, right, without changing things radically. Um, and the good news was there was radical change happening in parallel with that. Um, in the summer of 1942, around the time when the KV-1S um, was being developed, someone remembered, hey, what happened to, like, last year? We had all of these heavy tank projects um, from Factory 183. Uh, their T-44 was a heavy tank that weighed only 30 tons. Um, and then the T-34M was also supposed to be not a heavy tank, but quite heavily armored, uh, also about 30 tons. What happened to them? Let's bring them back. Uh, and so it's quite curious to see years a year later almost the same requirements being issued for essentially a heavy tank in a medium weight class. So the number to remember is 120. 120 millimeters, according to Soviet information, was the penetration of the um, 88 millimeter Flak 36, to the German anti-aircraft gun. Um, and that was the number to beat. So if your heavy tank had 120 millimeters of front armor, you're good. And so that was the goal, is how do you cram that much armor into a, a tank um, while still keeping it at 30 tons? The answer was you have to give up a lot. So the KV-13 originally is a, the 1942 version of the KV-13. The Red Army had, or the Soviet Union had strange tendency to recycle names and indexes for tanks, which makes things confusing. But um, the KV-13 introduced in 1942 had a two-man turret, uh, only one driver on the hull. So they got rid of the radio operator, they got a narrower turret ring, one uh, two-man turret. Um, if you look at the hull, it's now entirely cast. So the KV-1 had this very complicated, I uh, like a step. Uh, well, this isn't the KV-1, but you can see the step in the hull, right? You have the driver's plate here, it's 75 millimeters thick, and then this plate here, um, 60 millimeters thick. There's no weld seam between the two. That's because it's one plate and it's bent into shape with a press. Uh, and you can imagine this is really difficult to do. And so it's much easier to just cast the whole thing, right? And the other thing is you see the driver in the middle, you see the hull gunner next to him, Bunch of empty space here on this side because just no one's sitting there. Uh, there were some concerns about whether or not it was even useful to have a hull machine gun. Uh, debates about whether or not it was useful to have a hull machine gun rage before the war, during the war, after the war. Uh, they figured out that probably not. Um, but just in case, give the driver something to do so it doesn't feel left out. There's a hull machine gun that's just fixed pointing forward. I know the stat, and I was quite confused when I saw that. <laughs> he can press a button and shoot for a little bit. I don't know who's going to reload it, maybe when he has some spare time during battle. But um, that was there. And so elimination of a crew member, um, if you look at the shape of a BT, uh, BT-7 versus the shape of a T-34, right? So one's a rectangle, BT's a triangle, so you see kind of a similar narrowing of the front hull um, on, on the IS-2. And that could be achieved uh, because of this elimination of this extra crew member, so it could narrow the driver's compartment. And this was a very conscious decision in Soviet tank design. The front part of the tank is going to be the thickest. It's going to be the heaviest. So 
whatever you do, you want to reduce the width and height of your front armor. So if you look at the uh, T-34 turret, it narrows as it, as it moves towards the front. Um, because that front armor, you need to have it be as, as, as small as possible. Uh, even here... Oh, well, turret came off. But even here, you can see on the KV, is it's narrowing towards the front. Um, so this was something they very intentionally did on the turrets, but not so much on the hulls until this design. Um, and so when casting technology improved to the point where they could cast these very large, very complicated pieces, then the next step is variable thickness casting. So you can actually cast you know, your front to be 120 millimeters, and then the roof of the fighting compartment has to be like 30. Really hard to stamp, really easy to cast. Uh, after the war, they went really whole hog with these variable thickness casts and these tanks with ridiculous levels of protection. Um, but uh, these effects, you know, those this boards have started already during the war, and with the ice too, you kind of really see um, where where the weight savings were made. Turret, so I have the, the turret weight for, for the Panther and the IS-2. Um, there's a captured Panther turret with the turret ring. Weighs about 5 tons. Uh, IS-2 weighs 7.5. So there's no no magic happening here. Um, not really, Nothing you can do with the turret. That's very clever. You still need three, three people in there. You still need a big gun. It's going to be heavier. But uh, all the weight savings are in the hull. Uh, but I was talking about the KV-13. So they did make a 30-ton heavy tank. Uh, it went to the trials. And then the army went, well, two-man turrets are, aren't really in vogue anymore. Make it three. They went back to the drawing board. And they put out... Uh, oh, and, and the hull was also shorter. Uh, it was If you look at the KV-13 and the early IS-1, uh, it's five road wheels per side instead of six. So that saves quite a bit of weight, right? Hull's shorter. Um, they put it out, and then the army says, "Great, but um, we want the uh, the the track con ground the contact with the ground to be longer uh, for better flotation." Oh, and they also want the turret ring to be wider. Oh, and we also want an eighty-five millimeter gun. Uh, and so um, this kept happening and happening and happening, and the designers were going, "Hey, remember when the KV one kind of..." blew up by 10 tons. Uh, let's not do that again. So there was this very intentional, you know, fighting for every kilogram kind of process. And for the IS-2, the, the prototype, um, they expected the, the speed to drop to something ridiculous, like 30 kilometers an hour because they put in the bigger gun. Uh, and they took out the radio uh, in, again, only the prototype. Um, the real production tanks to all hot radios uh, to save on the weight. And it's just very, very, very pessimistic evaluation of how much this tank was going to weigh. It actually weighed less, much less than, than expected, whereas it usually weighs more. So, um, but uh, comparing to the Panther, right, so the Panther hull is, it, it's basically a box. The design, as the British put it, bristles with every complication. I really like that turn of phrase. Uh, but the actual composition of the hull is very, very simple. Um, where the complexity comes in is things like the interleaving road wheels. Uh, the IS-2 has fewer road wheels and they're smaller. So, uh, saves weight there, fewer torsion bars. Uh, the engine is lighter, so the, a dry V2 engine is about 800 kilograms. A dry Maybach um, 230. HL is 1200 and you know less horsepower smaller cooling system um, than, than on the Panther and there was also this very uh, again intentional prioritization about what do we actually put on on the tank uh, because after the war when you see uh, you see if you go right now and see a tank in a museum you will not see a World War II air IS-2 tank they're all modernized to some degree some tanks are more, some tanks are less. If you see the IS-2M, uh, where you know the rear hull machine gun was removed and uh, replaced with extra ventilation uh, fan, just now an unditching log. There's night vision equipment. There's um, 
what else do they have on there? Underwater driving equipment kit and all the stuff. And they piled it on. And the tracks are wider for parts compatibility with the T10. Uh, and so an IS2M fully stocked would be, like, I think it's almost 50 tons. So you can't have everything. Um, I don't think they had an underwater driving kit, even if they wanted to during the war. But um, again, it's this kind of very ruthless prioritization of what can we fit you know, uh, our goal was a 30-ton heavy tank. Now it's a 45-ton heavy tank. Um, after we've obviously expanded the the running gear, expanded the hull to fit all this stuff that we want to do, what do we actually, what's the least that we can put in to make this tank a, um, you know, fighting unit? Uh, whereas if you look at, um, you know, on, on the German side, there's a very loose attitude towards these kinds of requirements. That's, you know, eh, armor 60 millimeters. I don't know, let's make it 80. Uh, seal, seal the engine uh, compartment, make it watertight. Why not? I don't know. Well, while we're here, right, uh, there was a British document that I have in my collection where they're saying that the German tanks use so many ball bearings that the only possible explanation is that there's a cartel um that makes ball bearings that that uh, has some dirt on you know the tank designers uh because they're they're treating them with with such um you know disdain just put it putting them ever whatever put put them everywhere who cares everyone um, gets a ball bearing <laughs> yeah pretty much you know um yeah so it's it's this very kind of and again if if you're running this very top down command economy you can, you have a lot more leverage uh, over over the people who are delivering you tanks, and obviously there needs to be some kind of balance back and forth. Um, there's plenty of times when there were letters coming from below from the engineers, the designers, the factories, and saying, "No, what you're asking for can't be done," or you know, if you want to cut this thing, it's going to reduce this other aspect uh, of the design, um, which. You know, there's a couple of those documents in my blog. They're not super interesting to read because if you, uh, it turns out that people uh, arguing about requirements 80 years ago is about as exciting as people arguing about requirements today. Um, so Im imagine your average office life, but you're designing tanks instead of I don't know, angry birds. <laughs> yeah. So to to sum this up or and and to check if I got it correctly. So basically, the main factors was. Reducing the amount of room inside the tank, so getting one of one crewman, for instance, and generally, since a tank is basically everything needs to be heavily armored, as the smaller the space that is protected, the more weight one saves. Then there's also the dimensions with the width and the length, and also the height reduced as much as possible. Then the introduction of cast ammo and to make very specific parts and, and also keep it smaller, everything. Then um, the, for the road wheels, with smaller road wheels and fewer road wheels. I mean, this is particularly interesting for, for the Panther because the Panther has a very smooth ride due to this. Mm -hmm. So this has benefits, but it comes at the price, of course. Mm -hmm. Then there's also less horsepower. So less horsepower means smaller engine, but also less cooling and other stuff. So you're also reducing the weight again. And finally, also, doing away with all the uh, add-on stuff, basically. I mean, the Panther had an automatic um, uh, fire suppression system from mm -hmm. what I know and all the other stuff. So a lot of this was not, was was optimized in the eyes too. Mm -hmm. This is how you end up with a very, very lightweight tank that is very heavily armored and armed. Mm -hmm. I would also like to note that um, just because the tank was small doesn't mean that there wasn't enough room for people inside of it. Uh, at the same time, if the tank is large, doesn't mean there is enough room because it all matters how you use the space that you're given. So for the IS-2 specifically, there's a study, uh, an ergonomic study that was done on the, um, the prototype, the Object 240, where they said, you know, hey, move the commander scoop a bulge out, you know, move this flywheel up, move around the people inside the fighting compartment to 
you know, optimize the amount of space that they take up as human beings, right? And, you know, you're obviously going to move your arms around you as you work, but your legs, if you're the gunner, for example, you're just sitting there. So there's an er ergonomics textbook that I translated some uh, excerpts from where they actually have measured a the size of a person, right, sitting down, right? And if you're holding a flywheel in front of you, where is the most natural position for your hand? Um, if you're looking at a site, how much space do you, you know, where your, um, the back of your seat goes, everything like that. So there was a lot of effort the USSR put into ergonomics. Uh, whereas on the Panther, there's a video from the Kubica Tank Museum where the, um, uh, the host sits into a Panther tank and the commander's slot, um, and his arm goes into into the turret guard, uh, into the recoil guard of the gun, because there's no place to, to put it outside. He has to sit, sit like this if he wants to not have his arm cut off when the gun fires. Uh, and there's a, a British ergonomics report in the Panther tank that has some very interesting statements in there uh, about how the components inside the tank are arranged. So. Yeah, um, Chifton also mentioned, I think, something is in, inside the hatch that has various issues. I think the Tiger is rather spacey, but the Panther far less so, let's put it that mm -hmm. way. Yeah, um, <laughs> the Soviets had an interesting... There was a study of the medium tank M3, the Lee, uh, and they wrote that you can take 10 infantrymen with submachine guns, put them inside the tank, and, you don't and the tank can still operate. Yeah. So there's ton, like that, that means your tank is too big. There's lots of extra space in there that you're not using for anything. You're carrying, you know, you're paying a lot of money to carry around air. Yeah, I, I mean, the damn freely looks also quite funny or grand because you have this this 75 millimeter side gun and and then you have the small turret, but it's just it's it's it looks a bit like a bus, but. Uh, but the basically the, the basic tr uh, transmission and suspension system is is very sound. So mm -hmm. for me, it's basically the chassis below is really well done, but um, the the superstructure is like superstructure is basically interwar, and and the lower part is basically well, mid World War II standards. You could say that's what what makes it really interesting. I think mm -hmm. I called it a modern relic for for that reason and my video because it's, it's like yeah but it was just we need a tank put something out and and it it, it worked to a certain degree mm -hmm. yeah and i mean that's always the reality of any kind of engineering is your there's a lot of constraints both written and unwritten uh and if you just skip to the end and say well this tank was bad because you know it was slow or it was too big or it was too too small you're not really taking into yeah. account you know it's the history of how it came to be. Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, uh, basically, it's it's similar to my videos when people are, why didn't you do this or why didn't you mention that? Yeah, usually time constraints, source constraints. Uh, I didn't have access to the vehicle. I, I forgot to film that or, or along those lines. It's the same as, I mean, you are an engineer, so you, you know better. But mm. I, I have computer science background, so I also generally, let's say we usually think a lot before we make decisions and implement mm -hmm. something. If, if it's in steel or if it's in code, there's more generally more reasons than people can think of. So, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.